Coming up next on the Passion Struck Podcast. The number one correlate for health and longevity and successful aging, forget peak performance, and just successful aging, is strong legs. It's weird, but in, even in terms of cognitive benefits and preserving brain function, strong legs. There's a number of reasons they think that might be the case, but it doesn't change the fact that like, wow, my quadriceps, my hamstrings, my calves are going to determine the quality of the second half of my life in a really big way. Welcome to Passion Struck. Hi, I'm your host, John R. Miles. And on the show, we decipher the secrets, tips, and guidance of the world's most inspiring people and turn their wisdom into practical advice for you and those around you. Our mission is to help you unlock the power of intentionality so that you can become the best version of yourself. If you're new to the show, I offer advice and answer listener questions on Fridays. We have long form interviews the rest of the week with guests ranging from astronauts to authors, CEOs, creators, innovators, scientists, military leaders, visionaries, and athletes. Now, let's go out there and become passion struck. I am so ecstatic today to welcome Stephen Kotler to the Passion Struck podcast. It's good to be with you, John. Well, Stephen, I wanted to put your book up here and tell you congratulations on this fantastic new book. Hopefully it's going to be your 12th best-selling book. I got such a good read out of it because you and I are pretty much the same age. And so I'm at this point where I'm doing everything I can to learn more about peak performance aging, which we're going to talk about a lot today. Perfect. Let's dive in. Well, I thought it would help to set the stage for our interview. If you could discuss with the audience how you came up with NAR Country as the name of your book and why it's so important. So NAR Country, the book is about peak performance aging. The title is actually action sports slang. NAR is short for gnarly. And while people make fun of action sports slang all over the place, and that's fine, it's actually a very precise slang. Action sport ac athletes are performing in, in, in dangerous arenas, and they use a very precise language. And NAR is defined as any environment that is high in perceived risk and high in actual risk. Country is any landscape or terrain. NAR country, then, is both a really great description of our later years high in perceived risk, high in actual risk. And as it turns out, when we like dig under the hood of peak performance aging, it's a really fantastic description of sort of the gritty mindset it takes to thrive in our later years. So that's where the title comes from. I read in the book that you describe yourself as a child as skinny, klutzy, always scared and often slow. And the last person anyone would pick to be on a team we all have defining moments. How did your discovery of rock climbing and about with Lyme disease help you overcome the feeling of dirty old shame? And why in order to achieve this great peak performance we all seek, must we deal with personal forgiveness and traumas of the past? So this is really interesting research. One of the core ideas in the heart of our country is the idea of lifelong learning and the idea of taking on hard challenges in the second half of our lives. And it turns out we actually have certain advantages in going after these challenges. It turns out in our 50s, we gain access to a suite of legitimate cognitive superpowers. It happens because there are certain genes that only activate over time, and certain, there are changes in the brain that start coming online at that point. But if, if we do it right, and we're gonna come back to doing it right, because that's the sort of answer to your question, but if we do it right, we gain access to whole new levels of intelligence and really sort of abstract reasoning and logical thinking, really like complicated, rich areas of intelligence. There's whole new levels of creativity, open up divergent thinking, which is the hardest aspect of creativity to teach. We see whole new levels of empathy and wisdom, which basically says, how do we grow up? How do we become adults? I studied all this and said, and they, what they found is that while these changes do come online in their 50s, it's not guaranteed. And in order for them to be guaranteed, you have to pass through certain gateways of adult development along the way. By age 30, we need to solve the crisis of identity. We need to know who we are in the world. By 40, it's match fit. We need a tight fit between what we do in the world and who we are. In the world. And then by 50, the answer to your question, self-forgiveness 
and forgiveness of others becomes really key. And if we can't make these changes, we can't gain access to those new levels of intelligence and creativity and wisdom and empathy. So for me, as you pointed out, I spent a lot of my childhood not getting along very well with the jocks, with the traditional athletes. And it, it left some scars. And I didn't have most challenges when it comes to self-forgiveness and forgiveness of others. I find that loving kindness meditation is sort of the tool you need for the job. It works incredibly well. It's been incredibly well researched. The neuroscience of loving kindness meditation and passion was fantastic. But this was like something that was bigger than that. And I couldn't put it down that way. It wasn't going away. And so in a sense, I developed a fairly crazy athletic quest of my own as a way to try to forgive my past. And I had no idea, honestly, John, when I started out if it was going to work. I just didn't have any other ideas. It turned out it did work. And that's talked about throughout the book. But I was as shocked, I think, as anybody else that actually my crazy plan worked. Well, you are one of the leading experts on the science of peak performance and flow, and you wrote a fantastic playbook on it in a book called The Art of Impossible, which I would highly encourage the audience to read if you want a good backdrop into peak performance. And as you and I talked about before, this podcast is focused on how do you create an intentional life? And like you, I believe that any one of us can achieve peak performance, and that has to do a lot with the culmination of our daily choices in determining our long-term tsunami of greatness. So I wanted to ask, so you could frame it for the audience, what is the difference between peak performance and peak performance aging? So when I use the term peak performance, what I mean is nothing more or nothing less than getting our biology to work for us rather than against us. This is not a new idea. William James, sort of the godfather of psychology, pointed out in, in like 1901 that the great thing in any education is to make your nervous system, meaning your brain and your body, your ally, not your enemy. This is an old idea. It's not, it's not new. What is new is we know sort of what are the cognitive and what are the physical skills that would fall under the heading of biology that's sort of been shaped out. And the second half of your question is, what's the distinction between peak performance aging? Nothing more than getting our biology to work for us rather than against us when applied to the challenges of the second half of our lives. Um, that's really the difference. Just to take it one step further, so for everybody listening, some clarity. You mentioned the art and possible. The art and possible really focused on the cognitive side of the peak performance aging or peak performance equation. When you talk about cognitive skills and peak performance, there's actually four categories of skills. There's a bunch of skills that fall under the heading of motivation, another set of skills under the heading of learning, another set of skills under the head of heading of creativity, and finally, a bunch of skills that fall under the heading of flow, which is the state of optimal performance, peak performance that we're all hardwired for. So that combination. That's sort of cognitive peak performance. If you're looking on the physical side, there's really five sets of skills that matter, and it's strength, stamina, agility, balance, and flexibility. So if you're talking about the biology of peak performance, in a sense, you're talking about the biology underneath those nine sets of skills. There's more going on, obviously, but that's the quick and the dirty here. So if I look at this, hopefully in the correct light, what you were teaching in the art of impossible was kind of the science and what we we're going to talk more about in our country is the art of how you deploy it in your life. It's exactly correct. It was the one thing I couldn't do in the art of impossible. The book is, it's a fun book to read, but it's a very thorough breakdown of the science of peak performance. And if I wanted to add in the application, it would have been a 2000 page book and nobody would have read it. So I, in a sense, ended up splitting it into two books and you got the art of impossible, which was a little bit more of a playbook of a textbook, if you will and in our country, which is the applied side, and it's an adventure story. And hopefully if I did my job right, it's fun and it's a blast, blast to read. So it's an adventure story that teaches you a lot about applied peak performance aging, and it's a fun ride along the way if I did my job. Okay, well, you did, because in our country tells an in-depth story based on your journal entries over, I think it was an 18 month period, the story of you conducting a daring experiment in peak aging by teaching yourself how to park ski. And I was hoping for the audience, if they're not a skier or maybe they're a novice skier, what is park skiing and why was this such 
a huge magnitude of significance to try to attempt it at our age? So great questions. Thanks for asking them. Park skiing, if you saw the Olympics, Eileen Goo cleaned up as a park skier. It's the discipline in skiing that involves doing tricks off jumps, on rails, wall rides across boxes. It's very acrobatic. It's fairly dangerous. And for 12 to 15 different biological reasons, it is considered extremely difficult for anybody over the age of 30, 35 to start learning and get good. And once you reach 40, 50, it's considered just absolutely impossible and or insane. And I decided while I was a good skier, I had zero park skiing experience. And for a lot of different reasons, I decided I was going to try to teach myself how to park ski in my 50s. And essentially, there was a bunch of new science in my core field in flow science, in embodied cognition, which is sort of very related to the work I do, and in systems neuroscience, a handful of other fields that said, hey, at least on paper, right, in the lab, if these things are true, old dogs should be able to learn new tricks, even if the new tricks are these like really complicated, difficult physical skills that nobody thought you could onboard at this age. And so to run this experiment, what we did is we took park skiing and I made a list of 20 tricks that would essentially cover zero to intermediate. There was a reason I wanted to sort of get to intermediate. The main idea, once you get to intermediate, you can, the randomness and the stupid stuff you do because you don't know any better, it starts to fade away and you can sort of control your progression rate and you can control the damage you do. So while parking itself is very dangerous, I figured if I could get to intermediate, it would start to get a lot safer. And there were a lot of reasons why I took on this quest that peak performance agent reasons we could talk about all that. But the point is I made this list of 20 tricks and I thought if it takes five years, if I'm 60 years old by the time I figured this out, great, fantastic, wonderful. And it didn't take five years. It took less than a single season. And it was so shockingly fast. Um, and as you pointed out, I'm not a naturally gifted athlete. I'm a bad athlete. I have a very broken body. I've broken nearly 80 bones. And I run a big company and I write books and I have a very busy schedule. So I was up against a handful of challenges that made this fairly difficult quest on top of the fact that it was considered too socially impossible. And I did it in under a season and that was amazing. My ski partner, a guy named Ryan Wicks, who's 20 years younger than me, was a former actually sponsored park skier athlete who got injured, retired, had a family job, decided to come back to the sport at the same time I entered for the first time. And he made more progress than he's ever made in his life in a more compressed time. And we thought, oh my God, this is amazing. But this is also like the world's sexiest pilot study, right? We've run a very radical, but very small, but very cool pilot study in peak performance aging. So the following season, we came back and we took a group of 17 older adults, ages 29 to 68. We took the same protocol. We could talk more about what that protocol was that we, Ryan and I had used. And in four days on the hill, uh, taught them how to park ski or how to park snowboard. And these were like intermediate to advanced skiers or snowboarders when they started. Nobody really had any park experience. And you, by the way, don't take my word for any of this. You can read it in the book or you can go to narcountry.com, click on the peak performance aging experiment video. We made a video of these experiments so you can see that. There's another introduction to park skiing video which documents my progress. So you can see exactly what I did and you can read the white papers and everything else there as well. That's sort of the why and the what. We can go from there, but I'll stop there, Chad. If a regular listener is tuning in today, it's not every day that I have someone talking about skiing on the podcast. So they may be thinking, why should I spend my time today listening to these two guys talk about skiing? Can you? Fantastic question. Yeah, John, yeah. let me, I, I, you know, I didn't finish the story in all honesty, because once we were done with the 17 older adults, what we did is we, and we, by when I say we, I'm talking about, I'm the executive director of the Flow Research Collective. We're a research and training organization. On the research side, we studied the neurobiology of peak human performance in conjunction with researchers at Stanford and USC and UCLA, Davis, and then we publish our work in major neuroscience journals. And then we use what the science to train people. We train people in 130 countries, tens of thousands of people every month. We're data geeks, so we measure everything and anything. So we have a really good global, wildly diverse set look at exactly what works and what doesn't. So that's the we I'm talking about. So we took these ideas 
stripped out the action sports because you're right. Like there are reasons action sports are really important or think there are reasons that things that action sports bring to us are really important for peak performance aging. We can talk about those in a second, but let's openly admit not for everyone, right? Not for everybody. And so we stripped out the action sports and we put everybody through a training. The training had two main goals. Goal one was radically shift people's mindset towards aging. Mindset, if you want to understand peak performance aging, you've got to start with mindset. There's 50 years of research that shows that aging is as much a mental event or a mental process as a physical process. In fact, a positive mindset towards aging translates to an extra seven and a half years of health and longevity in study after study after study in like long 20 year studies with thousands of subjects, very rigorous science, very well established. So in the class, the goal was, can we radically shift people's mindset? Cause that's the place you have to start. And can we help them design what I would call a NAR style quest for themselves, which was, if you want to sum up peak performance aging in a sentence, it's if you want to rock to your drop, you want to engage in challenging, creative social activities that demand dynamic, deliberate play and take place in novel outdoor environments. And we could talk about why all those things exist. That's the reason action sports matter, right? Because dynamic is a fancy way of saying I'm using all five categories of functional fitness at once. Why? Because if you're not using them all at once, right, you just want to rock to your drop, but you're not interested in action sports. Well, the World Health Organization is very clear on what you need to train for peak performance aging. It's 150 to 300 minutes of aerobic activity a week, moderate to vigorous, two strength training days a week, three balance agility and flexibility training days a week. That is roughly two hours a day of training, five days a week. Or you can pick an action sport that hits all those categories at once. And if action sports are not your thing, you can actually Hike with a weight vest. Hiking through nature with a weight vest actually covers a lot of the same things you're getting from a lot of these other things in a much more toned down basis. But why would you want to do any of these things? Let's just roll that back. The old story about aging, John, and I'm sure you're familiar with this. It's what I like to call the long, slow rot theory. This is the idea that you and I grew up with, which is that all of our mental skills and our physical skills decline over time and there's nothing we can do to stop the slide. Turns out it's not true. Yes, our mental skills and our physical skills do actually start to decline, some as early as our 30s, some in our 50s, but they're all, it turns out, user losing skills. But we never stop using them. We get to hang on to them and advance them far later in life than anybody thought possible. And that includes our physical abilities. In fact, the number one correlate for health and longevity and successful aging, forget peak performance, and just successful aging, is strong legs. It's weird, but even in terms of cognitive benefits and preserving brain function, strong legs. There's a number of reasons they think that might be the case, but it doesn't change the fact that like, wow, my quadriceps, my hamstrings, my calves are going to determine the quality of the second half of my life in a really big way. So you really do want to stay on top of the physical stuff. Yeah, it's one of the reasons after interviewing as many people as I have on the show, that I follow a similar exercise routine to you. I do a ton of cycling as a way to build up my endurance days, but I probably walk 50 to 60 miles a week. I haven't tried the weighted vest. I did a bunch of that when I was in the military, so maybe it's something I got to bring back into my routine. But I like you're recommending build in strength days. But the most important thing I try to work on is keeping my legs strong. I just didn't realize there was a link to that to my longevity and cognition. So interesting yeah, and, point you and, bring and, up. And, and, yeah. So let's also add in one other thing that you're doing because you're outside. So if you want to stave off dementia, Alzheimer's, cognitive decline, you want to birth new neurons and you want to build new neural networks. And we learned back in the nineties that there are new neurons that are born in the adult brain that we know. And it, we've learned more recently that most of that neurogenesis takes place in the hippocampus. This is a hippocampus, it's a Latin word for the seahorse looking structure deep in the center of your brain. And it is in charge of long-term memory and location. It's a place that's packed with grid cells and place cells. Why we're hunter gatherers, right? We evolved that way. So remembering where you were when you found that right fruit tree or where you were when you got attacked by the bear or where you, right? Those sorts of things, critical to survival. So this part of the brain was evolved 
to rem remember when we have emotionally charged incidents in novel outdoor environments. So action sports, which I mentioned earlier, one of the reasons they're so great for peak performance aging is they're packed with emotionally charged incidents in novel outdoor environments. You can get those in other ways, but the novel outdoor environments is what the brain evolved to remember, still getting our biology to work for us rather than against us. You wanna have those experiences. You wanna help your biology as much as possible. So Stephen, one of the things a listener may be saying to themselves right now is these guys are talking about a lot of time investment here to do this. And I know as you were doing this novel experiment, if I have the data correct, not only were you continuing to do hikes with your dog along the way, you were releasing a book, editing a second book, writing a third book, all at the same time that this was going on. So my question would be, if you're a listener and you're thinking to yourself, I can't do this, I don't have time, I'm aging, there's no way I can do the things that these guys are talking about, what is the cost of procrastination in achieving our aspiration? You inverted it on me. So what is the cost of procrastination? Our soul, like our life force, our purpose, our everything. Everything is the cost of procrastination. I said this in Art of Impossible. As far as I can tell, we get the thing that we are all going to agree on is we get one shot at this life. Maybe we get more, but we're all going to agree that we get one shot. And we know we're going to spend a third of it asleep. So what you do with the remaining two thirds is the only question that matters. And procrastinating um, on your dreams makes absolutely zero sense in, in, in light of those facts, as far as I'm, I can tell. Yeah, I think we go through this period where oftentimes we arson the very dreams that we're trying to make happen meaning we're on this path to nearing our highest talents and then the scared side of us rears its ugly head and we start saying like i was saying before i can't do this i can't create the time i'm too old if you're asking me about the time issue there's a ton of time management stuff that you have to do with the performance engineering. i do spend a lot of time on this in the book and i think it's worth touching on for a second which is i look for and we do this at the flow research collective we train people in 130 countries there's one, they're wildly diverse people. And we train a whole bunch of different companies, wildly diverse companies as well. The one thing everybody we train has in common, everybody's busy. Everybody's really busy. So we are always looking for what I call multi-tool solutions, which are a single tool that solve multiple challenges at once. Action sports are a multi-tool for the physical side of peak performance aging. You have to train five different categories of fitness. You have to be able to train your stabilizer muscles and your prime movers and a bunch of other things. Action sports is one-stop shopping, right? You pick up an action sport. And you, by the way, so is tennis and bad. They will also all the, also do this job for you too. As long as you're playing in outdoor courts, you're just not getting as much of the novel outdoor environments. So like play tennis and couple it with long hikes in the woods and you're in the neighborhood kind of thing. But that's that side of it, right? If you're, we're all too busy to solve problems one at a time. If you're solving problems one at a time, that's dumb. That's a bad idea. It's, that's not, a, you want multi-tool solutions or you want, when I sometimes something I'm, I talk about again in our multiple stack protocols, and I talk about it in our country too. A stack protocol is, for example, if you're going to go after this kind of hard physical challenge, you're going to need an active recovery program, right? Passive recovery is TV and a beer, and it doesn't do you any good when you're trying to recover from either cognitive or physical challenges. Alcohol tends to mess up sleep patterns, so th there's problems there, and television actually blocks recovery. You no, know, it, it feels relaxing, but it's not actually relaxing for our brain and, and it actually blocks recovery. So you want an active recovery protocol. I like saunas. I like breath work. Reading is also really good. And I like to stack them up. So I will, at the end of my day, I'll either go into an Epsom salt bath or a sauna and I will meditate and then I will read. And it's a single thing I'm doing recovery, but I'm stacking three different recovery protocols. And I want to just mention from peak performance aging standpoint, recovery all those things that I was just talking about, they're meant to reduce stress levels and lower inflammation levels. There are nine known causes of aging. Every single one of them is directly tied to stress and inflammation. So anytime we're, we have an active recovery protocol, where we're fighting inflammation, we're fighting stress. Not only are we achieving peak performance because you need those things for peak performance, we're also achieving peak performance aging. So multi-tools.
and stack protocols is how I take on the time management stuff, both myself and for all the people we have the good fortune to train. Well, you mentioned that as we enter our 50s, we gain access to a suite of legitimate superpowers. What are those superpowers and how are we impacted by one of the things that often gets in our way, which is our ego? So those superpowers are what we mentioned earlier. It's the new levels of intelligence and new levels of creativity, new levels of wisdom and new levels of empathy. And the shorthand for how to think about this is our ego starts to quiet and our perspective starts to widen. So like you look at the levels of intelligence that that, that come online, there are things like the ability to multi-perspectival thinking, right? The ability to see multiple sides of a problem. Um, the end of sort of black and white thinking. We start to realize that black and white thinking is sort of a folly of youth and everything is a little gray underneath and those kinds of things. These are kind of empathetic, wise, seeing things from multiple points of view. If we've got a big ego, if we're absolutely saying that our point of view is the only point of view, we're blocking these abilities. More than that, it's also, so we talked about the gateways of adult development, right, and self-forgiveness being one of them. But to really unlock these abilities, there's three other things that matter. The first is that it's creative activities, challenging creative activities that seem to really unlock these new levels of intelligence, empathy, wisdom, and creativity. So creativity unlocks creativity is one way of thinking about it. But it means that as we enter our 50s, for sure, we really want to make sure we're engaging in challenging creative activities. Simultaneously, if we want to hold on to these, superpowers into our broader 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s, and so forth, two things matter. One, you have to train down risk aversion. The risk aversion tends to increase over time. Certain categories don't actually increase, but as a rule, it increases over time. The problem with risk aversion is there's fear underneath it, right? That's what we're talking about here. It's an increase in fear, an increase in caution. And that means an increase in the cortisol and norepinephrine, right? Like stress hormones and anxiety hormones. And there are real costs for that. First of all, when you have those hormones in our system, we age faster, right? Second of all, it really impacts our decision-making. So the more norepinephrine in our system, the less creative and the more logical and linear. And don't give me a new solution. Give me something that works 100% of the time, right? We also, born our epinephrine and cortisol in our system, we block learning. So we're not, we stop learning, we stop growing, and there's all kinds of performance penalties. We don't, we actually can't perform at our best, fast twitch muscle response, doesn't work so well, et cetera, et cetera. So there's a big penalty for risk aversion and it blocks our superpowers, right? And simultaneously, you have to train down physical fragility because even though we get all these cognitive superpowers, if your body starts to fall apart on you, you can't take advantage of any of them. So this is sort of a look at like what we gain access to and what was one of the reasons I could learn how to park ski in my 50s. It's a very creative activity. I took a very creative approach to it and all that stuff actually started to come into play in our approach and it really helped me out, but you have to train for it. You, the development is not guaranteed in a sense. So I want to get into the training that you went through, but I'm going to introduce it in this way. You were not new to the slopes. In fact, you regarded yourself, even when you're in your 20s, as an excellent skier. But you got a really rude awakening in the mountains in France in 1994 when you tried to follow a group of what you could say are professional skiers down the hill. What did you learn about yourself at that moment? And then over the next 20 years, how did you create what you call stylish self-expression. Well, so when I started my career, I was a journalist. And one of my beats was neuroscience and peak performance. Another beat was action sports. The, the similar themes that we're seeing in our country. And I was lucky enough to spend about 10 years chasing professional athletes across oceans and down mountains. And I was in Chamonix, France, to the birthplace of modern extreme skiing with literally the American pioneers of extreme skiing, John and Dan Egan and Doug and Eric Delorier, all four in the skiing hall of fame, some of the most legendary skiers ever. And we were in Chamonix for extreme ski workshop. And 
up at that, to that point, before I got to Chamonix, I would have told you I was an expert skier. I had started skiing when I was about seven. I skied, I ski bummed after college in Aspen. I spent a ton of time skiing along the way. I could generally make my way down any double black diamond expert professionals. And anybody who's ever gotten into the room with professional athletes is if you're not a professional, you've had this experience where you suddenly realize that you may be an expert, but the gap between you and the pros versus like you and somebody who does has never even played the sport before it's bigger. Like you don't, you look at the pros and you're like, I don't understand that. It doesn't make sense. How did they get, they're not that much older than me. Like, how did this happen? It doesn't, it's, it's unfathomable. It was like, especially in the early days of extreme skiing, when what people were doing impossible feats over and over again, it was like watching a magic trick. It didn't make any sense. It took me from, um, that was 1994. It was in, I give the date in the, it was 2013, I want to say. I was in Jackson Hole, chasing, skiing around with an all-star posse, professional athletes. And I noticed that we were all getting to the chairlift at the exact same time. And after 20 years of chasing these guys around the mountain for the very first time, I could keep up. Not in the big mountain. Like we go to Alaska, they still kick my ass, but like in Jackson Hole, which is a serious mountain, I was finally able to keep up, but I wasn't as you I super interested in just keeping up. I wanted what they had, which is the ability to use creative self-expression to kind of interpret the mountain. And that's what the athletes could do. And it didn't matter what train feature was in front of them. They could find a way to do something interesting with it. That was what was really intriguing to me about action sports also. And this is something that a lot of, if you're on the outside looking in, action sports look like sports. But for most of the practitioners on the inside, they feel like they're involved in a creative art form as much as an athletic activity. And so stylish self-expression is really sort of key to the sport and especially the freestyle skiing. Yeah, I was going to say when I've been to the resorts and I am a decent skier, but I'm nowhere close to the magnitude of greatness you are or the people that you're describing. But I remember when I would go by the terrain areas it really is watching people do stylish self-expression by the different moves that they put on. And these are tricky things from a timing perspective, from the risk consequence that if you don't nail it right, the repercussions that could happen to your body. I just wanted to put the backdrop that when you started this, it's not as if you put this plan into motion and everything fell right into place as you wanted it. It happened in March of 2020, right as the COVID stuff was hitting us. and if I remember correctly, you were about maybe days into this when they basically shut everything down. Yeah, they shut it down before. It, so at the front of the quest, a bunch of things that happened. One, for reasons we don't have to go into, but I was burned out beyond belief. I'd worked literally nine years with almost no vacations. No, and I had moved my family from New Mexico to Tahoe and the whole thing had been this plan and I was going to get to Mar. I, I was launching a new book in January and I was going to get to March and then I was going to take a break. I was going to take two months off, first time in nine years and ski. And instead, I got COVID and then 10 days later, all the resorts in America got shut down because of COVID and we're in the middle of a pandemic. Everybody's suffering. Millions of people are dying and yet I'm getting angry and angry because I can't ski. And I feel like progress had been stolen from me and my time to advance shrinking. And it started with, well, well, how could I assuage the thing? Because it was really gotten to the point. It was an unhealthy anger. Like I was <laughs> yelling at the dogs, yelling at my wife. Like and it was totally like it was nobody's fault, right? It was on me. But like I was like, okay, I gotta solve this shit. Oftentimes, I believe that like when face sometimes when facing burnout for me, I'll invent like crazy quest. Like sometimes that's what really works for me. When your back is up against a wall, create an even bigger, harder challenge and go at that. And I think that's what I did. But it was really about like what could I do that was gonna make this feel better? And I was like, oh, I want to enter next ski season a better ski skier. How do I do that? Maybe I should learn to park ski. And as you pointed out, like I started, we built a rail jam set up in an abandoned gold mine in the mountains behind my house in, in, in Nevada. And I tried to learn how to rail slide 
like on dirt with dirt skis. And it, it was crazy. I like the amount of violence I did to myself even before I got the ski season was pretty ridiculous. But that was another thing I discovered is you're so much tougher and less fragile than you think you are. And that's always a lesson you have to sort of remind yourself of. Well, the other key thing I wanted to pull away here is if you've got a dream, you're going to run into obstacles like you did. But instead of letting the dream just linger, you found alternate ways to pursue it. And having worked at Lowe's for many years, I never thought I would have ever heard the use case that you came up with for using cardboard and artificial grass and PVC to create this free ski park that you did, but you didn't allow yourself to willow in your pity. And instead you tried to change the circumstances so that you could do whatever you could to get prepared, including then also learning how to do some of these tricks using trampoline parks as another way to enhance it. So I think it's a key learning for someone who's trying to pursue their goals. The thing I want to emphasize with all those things is that one of our core philosophies was go one inch at a time. So like the whole, everything I did was built around a handful of sort of foundational peak performance ideas about flow. One of them is flow is a state of optimal performance, right? Everything goes through the, through, through the roof. So including learning. So if you're trying to onboard a new skill like park skiing, you want to maximize your time and flow. One of the big insights, so float states have triggers. You want more flow in your life. The triggers are sort of your toolkit. And there are 26 known flow triggers, but they all have one thing in common, which is flow. That state where we get so focused on what we're doing, so focused on the task at hand, everything else just starts to disappear. So that complete concentration is at the heart of flow. That's what all the triggers do. They drive our attention to the present moment. The most famous of these is the challenge skills balance. It's the idea that we pay the most attention to the task at hand when the challenge of the task slightly exceeds our skill set. So you want to stretch but not snap. Metaphorically, this is not actual science, this is just metaphor. We talk about that in, in most people, that's about a 5% difference, right? That we pay the most attention to the task at hand when the challenge of the task is about 5% greater than our skill set. But in older adults, and by the way, older here could mean anything over 25, 30, right? Like the point at which you start to get more cautious, more conservative, more protected. This is from that point forward because of something called allostatic load, which is basically the, the residual physiological and psychological impact of trauma over time. We talk about in burnout, allostatic overload is one of the main causes of burnout, but allostatic load, because of it, we realize that this challenge skills sweet spot is going to shrink in older adults. And instead of being like 5%, we think it was down to about 1%. So at the core of what I did in park skiing, at the core of what I did to train for park skiing, at the core of what I did with the trampolines, all of it was about how do you start with an established skill, so an established motor skill that then you can execute with zero fear because fear blocks learning and performance and everything else and almost 100% chance of success and then build on it with like one micro movement at a time going as, as slowly and as safely as possible. And it's a much slower progression than most people are actually used to. And it, the funny thing about going so slowly is we ended up going so much faster. Even when we were running our experiment, we spent more time trying to hold people back rather than trying to push them forward. And that's a very sort of different approach. We were trying to creatively interpret the mountain in novel ways, not learn new tricks. So there were differences in how we approached it. And this is sort of like the philosophy that was underneath it. But the thing that you want to know is that these kinds of hard physical challenges are totally doable, but you got to go at them differently than you would have when you were younger. Yeah, and I remember in the book, you went into this season hoping that you would get a good 50 days on the slope and you end up surpassing well past 80. But to what you were just talking about, why was it so important for you to do something daring almost every single time that you went out that actually terrified you? Because I think this is something that's so important chasing any goal that we have is you've got to put yourself into this point of being uncomfortable. You don't have to take it a mountain degree further the next time. You just have to do micro increments of it 
But what does doing that do to your realization of goals over time? There's a so many answers packed into to what you just said, but I think the, the, the let's start with the end of it because I think it was that maybe that maybe the point that, that is most important, which is where does momentum come from? How do we get momentum in the face of like even possible physical challenges where we're going really slow? Like momentum is all about dopamine, the neurochemical dopamine, and it is really small goals accomplished daily time after time so progress is really important and you said earlier that i would have to go to the mountain and most of the time i had to show up and do something that scared me that's because i was learning new tricks i was having to like take physical chances even if they weren't super risky but they felt like up here was super risky and i this is really important flow so i do the same thing forget what i do on the mountain every day i'm a writer every day i'm a scientist and i want to push my skills to the utmost to like, so I'm in that challenge skills sweet spot, it closer to flow. I'm always aiming for that and in everything I do. And, you know, it, it's just the little wins produce dopamine, the dopamine over that dopamine over time, that's momentum. You get like little, those little blasts of dopamine over time, plus regular access to flow. That is literally what we describe as momentum. And one of the cool things about momentum and the reason I like chose it out of the big thing you had asked as the place I want to start is another peak performance aging tip. So when we get, when we are accomplishing our small goals, right, when we're pushing on the challenge skills, sweet spot. What we really are getting is feelings of mastery, right? I'm learning, I'm growing, and control. And I got to control a little more in my world than I did the day before, right? And both of these are among the best emotions that are available to humans. We love this feeling of like, I'm in control, and I'm a master of my world. We love these feelings. And it turns out super positive emotions, like mastery and control, produce, they amplify the production of T cells and natural killer cells. So T cells are the, what fight disease, right? Immunological cells and natural killer cells are the cells that type target tumors and other sick cells. So like literally the issues we have with aging. So as we're pursuing lifelong learning and going after these harder goals and gathering this momentum, we're gaining feelings of mastering and control. And by the way, the, the, those feelings come baked into flow. If you drop into flow, one of the state's core psychological characteristics is this feeling of control. It's really tied to flow. So flow tends to build on that stuff. And as a result, we this ends up turning into health and longevity. So it's not just momentum for the sake of I'm going after my goals. It's momentum for the sake of I'm going after my goals. And, and guess what? You're going to get more life to go after your goals as a result which is kind of a cool thing. Well, you gave me the answer I was looking for in that you were using that technique to help continue the momentum going, which is so important in any of our journeys. Well, I'm going to jump to your last chapter because you bring up someone that I'm familiar with, but most people would not be, and that is Gene Cohen. And in the book, you give him credit as being the grandfather of peak performance aging. What did Cohen discover while he was working at the National Institute of Mental Health about three profound changes that take place in our brains that lead to three thinking styles that you lay out in the book. Gene Cohn is the pioneer of sort of these superpowers of aging that we've been talking about. The three thinking styles are sort of this multi-perspectival thinking that we describe, but Gene's cool. Like it's worth it. I love that you know him. That's so cool. And his story is so neat. So he is the last doctor drafted into Vietnam. It's 1973, and he's literally like the last guy the draft board calls up to serve. And instead of going to fight, he goes to work in like a veteran's home or something. And he's a young psychiatrist. And at the time, this is when the long, slow rot theory is the theory of aging. And there's also a, there's a couple of concurrent beliefs. One, that old people you can't learn new tricks, right? That learning is impossible. And older people, that they're really sort of inflexible of thought. They're uneducable. They're depressed. They're lonely. It's built in part. of All these things are believed about the age. And in fact, if you really want to see something mind-blowing, in the 1950s, Harry Truman when he's founding the Social Security Administration, sends out a letter to all the people who are coming to the first conference 
And he says, look, we're all coming together because we're going to solve Social Security. But like, let's get a couple of things straight about the aging. Like this, these are the facts as we now know them. Fact one, old people have feelings just like you and me. I mean, it's like you read this shit and you're like, what are you insane? Old people have feelings just like you. I'm like, what? Really? <laughs> this is new? So Gene Cohn is coming up in this environment at 73. He goes into these veteran affairs situations and he realizes that somebody's been lying to him about all people. Like the folks he's hanging out with don't fit any of the stereotypes. They're not shutting down. He's seeing all kinds of like creative flowering and all kinds of stuff. So he finishes his service and he petitions the National Institute of Mental Health to create the National Institute of Aging. He becomes the first director and he runs two foundational studies. He takes a real look at retirement. He's the first guy to sit down and be like, okay, we've heard about retirement. He's, by the way, the origin of, you've probably heard this. If there's one bit of advice for peak performance aging, it's never retire, right? It's, that's really not a good idea if you want to hold on to your skills and advance them later in life. So he does this study on retirement and learns a whole bunch of stuff about like, oh, wow, what we do in this in the latter, latter years is very different from what people think is going on. And then he does a study on the impact on creativity and Remember, it's that creativity unlocks these superpowers of aging. So what he had noticed is that science, right? The science and neurogenesis was just like, we didn't know it yet. It wasn't actually discovered through the 90s. Some of the genetics was starting to come into place. Like, Wait a minute, there's certain genes that are only activated with experience. So they're only going to get turned on in our 40s and 50s. And what, what actually happens in our brain that leads to these new thinking styles that you referenced is two sides of the brain start talking to each other like never before, right? The hemispheres essentially operate semi-independently. Stuff is like, it's, it comes in on the right, which is where we do novelty, and it gets passed to the left side, which is where we do familiarity. And so over time, actually, the right side starts to fade out a little bit. The left side becomes stronger. But like, why do we gain access to new levels of creativity? And why can we see things from multiple perspectives? Because these two sides of the brain are talking to each other. And cool, even better, the brain starts to colonize underutilized areas. So if there's parts of the brain that aren't really, let's say you're not a musician, you're not really using a lot of like temporal lobe where a lot of the music stuff would normally live. So your brain might say, okay, let's send some language stuff over there or send some memory stuff over there. And so you start to colonize this underutilized real estate. And as a result of these things, so things do change in the brain over time. And there's stuff that goes down. This is the stuff that goes up. It's how we compensate for all of it. It's the trade-off. And that was all to Gene Cohen. As you pointed out, I think of if you're going to point to folks as the, like the godparents of this thinking, the godfather would be Gene Cohen. And I think Ellen Langer, who is at, at Harvard, she's probably the godmother. And Gene Cohn, Ellen was the one who figured out mindset and the, sort of the, the mind-body connection and aging and things like mastery and control, producing T cells and that's all Ellen's side. And Gene Cohn's the creative superpowers of aging side. And you put them together, and then you sort of add in the like the research that, that I've conducted that's going on in around what's physically possible also, and you start to get the picture of oh, wow, the second half of our lives are really interesting. It's true. That's the truth of the matter is like, none of this stuff is actually accurate and our older ideas were wrong and don't fit the data. So like we're living into what's true and it's a better fit for all of us. Yeah, well, I love how you put in there that uh, a key thing that in our country showed was that Gene Cohen was right about peak performance. And so I'm gonna just flip back before I ask you the last question. I just wanted to highlight for the audience, three core themes that we talked about today. One of those was stack protocols, and that is where we do multiple things at once. And that's where Stephen was talking about you wearing this vest on your hiking and how you can stack things together. He also used that same analogy when he talked about multi-tool solutions for healthy aging, peak performance aging. And then the other thing we talked about was that in our country is really about chasing down your dreams before it's too late to achieve them. And that's why a flow first, risk second approach is so important. And then last thing real quick for the audience, where's the best place that they can go to learn more about you? Narcountry.com will get you everything cool about the book. You wanna learn more about me, stephencotler.com, theflowresearchcollective.com, 
And if you're interested in an in any peak performance training, that's flow training might sounds interesting to you. That might be a thing you're, you can just go to getmoreflow.com and sign up for a free, like hour long coaching call with one, one of the members of my staff. And those are great calls. People have a lot of fun. There's a lot of value there and you'll learn a little bit about what we do and probably a lot about yourself. And so getmoreflow.com for anybody who's curious, narcountry.com is the book, stephencolley.com is me. Flow Research Collective is all things Flow Research Collective, and, and I'm on social. You can find me there as well. Well, Stephen, thank you for coming on. I'm going to show the book one more time. Congratulations on this, and I highly encourage the audience to give it a read, regardless of what age you are. Thanks, John. Fun hanging out with you. I thoroughly enjoyed that interview with Stephen Kotler, and I wanted to thank Stephen, Rick Craven, and Harper Wave for the honor and privilege of having him appear on the show. You're about to hear a preview of the Passion Struck podcast interview I did with Dr. Amy Shaw, who is a double board-certified medical doctor and nutrition expert with training from Cornell, Columbia, and Harvard Universities. And we discuss her new book, I'm So Effing Hungry, Why We Crave What We Crave and What to Do About It. So that gut bacteria kind of acts as an army and they are communicating with our brain. They're communicating with our hormones, with our immune system, and they are helping us digest. They're helping us make decisions. They are helping us create cravings for the right things. And the sad thing is, John, that we didn't really understand this, and 97% of Americans are starving that gut bacteria. The fee for this show is that you share it with family or friends when you find something useful or inspirational. If you know someone who's really into longevity science and personal performance, then definitely share today's episode with them. The greatest compliment that you can give us is when you share the show with those that you care about. In the meantime, do your best to apply what you hear on the show so that you can live what you listen. And until next time, live life passion struck.